From the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, this is Human Centered. Have you ever wondered what makes a successful protest movement? In the context of political conflict and polarization, what does it take to shift people's beliefs and inspire action in service of social change? In this episode of Human Centered, we get to the heart of these questions by bringing into conversation two CASBIS fellows with a deep and varied expertise on these matters, Iran Halprin and Rob Willer. Halprin is a 2022 to 23 CASBIS fellow and is a social psychologist based at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, where he heads the Psychology of Intergroup Conflict and Reconciliation Lab. His research integrates psychological and political theories to investigate causal factors driving intergroup conflict and develop new approaches for modifying the psychological roots of intolerance, exclusion, and intergroup violence. The unique case of Israeli society in general, and that of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in particular, motivates much of his work. And as you're about to hear, in recent months he has been in a unique position to apply research on the ground in real time, as few social scientists are ever in a position to do. Rob Willer has been a CASBIS Fellow twice, in 2012 to 2013, and again in 2020 to 2021. He is a professor of sociology here at Stanford University, where he also directs the Polarization and Social Change Lab. He focuses on the social forces that bring people together and drive them apart. He's applied his work mainly in the context of political attitudes in the United States, investigating techniques for overcoming polarization, building political consensus, and using political psychology to construct persuasive messaging. In the episode notes, we'll link to some of the key works that Halpern and Willer and their collaborators have produced that relate to today's topics, and we'll also throw in links to key organizations they each affiliate with. What does it mean for a protest to be effective? How should it be measured? What is the role of violence, or short of that, what Halpern refers to as constructive disruption? Does the current evidence allow us to generalize across countries? And are they optimistic or pessimistic about the prospects for positive social change in Israel and the United States? Their thoughts may surprise you. And a note to listeners, this conversation was recorded on May 31st, 2023, during the height of the judicial reform protest occurring in Israel. Since then, there have obviously been a lot of new developments in the conflict, so keep that in mind, and we recommend you stay up to date with the unfolding situation there. So let's listen in to Iran and Rob's conversation. Okay, uh, so Iran, we've uh, we've been friends for a while and colleagues for for even longer than than that, uh, and I've been a fan of your work for for longer than than you probably know, uh, more than a decade, and so it's been great to have you here at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences this year. And it's going to be great to have a conversation with you about our respective research on social movements. So maybe a good way to kick things off would be to invite you to uh, to briefly introduce uh, yourself and, and offer some thoughts on how you came to study collective action and social movements. Well, thank you, Rob. Uh, such a pleasure to be here with, with you. Um, I'm really looking forward to this to this, this discussion. Um, I, I'll say, you know, on, on my side that I'm, I, I've been interested in, in in social change, broadly speaking, for for many years. And what we've been doing in our lab, uh, in 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 different ways, on different levels, is is mainly asking questions about change. I mean, how do you change people's emotions? How do you change people's attitudes? How do you change this very very difficult situations of? Of conflicts in my case, you know, coming from the the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, so it's it's mainly how do you change people's I, I usually call it hearts and minds of of people who are involved in conflicts for for so many years, and I think that one 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 uh, 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 thing that I've learned throughout the years is that especially when we talk about the the high power groups, the groups that you know that hold most of the privilege and, and, and power in the context of conflict. It's, it's a sad fact, I think, but they don't give up their power just out of, you know, goodwill or their moral values in, in most cases. At least from my, I don't think it's not really, it's not an empirical, you know, finding, but that's my, you know, view of, of the way things are happening. 
and, and if and, and if that's true, then when we think about macro level changes in hierarchy in societies, collective action must be involved. So it's not enough, you know, to teach people, to train people, to try and convince people something more proactive has to be involved in the process of creating, you know, large scale changes in, 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 in societies. And this is when my study moved. And, and actually, I'm, I'm rather new in this area. So for many years, I've been studying interventions for change in terms of attitudes and emotions. But my study on, on, on collective action as a vehicle for change has started only, I would say, four years ago, or five years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and since then, it's, you know, it's, it's, it has become one of the main things that we're, we're doing in our lab. And, and, and the main focus is, is, is on asking what can make collective action effective. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe we'll talk about it later because I think that it's, it's very, very much involved to, to your work and to the, you know, the fascinating work that you've been doing in, in your lab throughout the years. I think that you've started studying collective action or, or social movements before, way before I started doing uh, some of this work. And, and you've done it also in, in many different contexts and, different, and about different social and, 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 and political questions. So I'm really, really curious to hear, first of all, you know, what, what led you to study these, these, these questions, questions related to social movements and, 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 and collective action. And, and, and also maybe what, what do you find most interesting in, in this area right now? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'd, I'd love to dig into it. Um, one thing, if you don't mind, before we move off of you, Iran, I was wondering if, if you'd mind if I asked what personally brought you to the study of collective action? Um, if, if you wouldn't mind, you know, like, did you have personal experiences that made it really matter to you? Was it just an inevitability of growing up in the Israeli-Palestinian context? Like, if you wouldn't mind, I'd be super curious to hear your own personal story a little bit. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to talk about it. So, so I will say that w- what led me to study collective action is is basically what led me to study questions about change. And, and more specifically, questions about change in, in the context of conflicts. And, and I think that, you know, my, my, the, the, the major personal event that I've experienced is, I think it was 25 years ago. I'm getting old, Rob. If it's, if it's 25 <laughs> I, I, years ago. I couldn't ago, tell. <laughs> I couldn't tell. <laughs> it's good that it's podcast. No one can see it. So <laughs> right, yeah, you can say yeah. that I look much you younger. You don't have to but, say it was 25 yeah. years ago. They don't know. So, so 25 years ago, I was, I was an officer in a special unit in the Israeli army. Uh, and I was very seriously injured. In a, I, I often call it in a non-important event in the history of this conflict, which was important you know, only for me and for probably for my family, but I was I was uh, injured in in Lebanon as as part of a, a a militant encounter between Hezbollah fighters and and the Israeli army. Yeah, I was hospitalized for uh, three months in in an ER and then for almost four years in a rehabilitation center. Uh, and and again, I I can talk about it more, but I think that the more important thing here is that. The, the, the first and most important thing that I, you know, got from from this entire experience was was my understanding or you know sense that we simply cannot accept the the reality as it is. Yeah. Can, we cannot accept it. One of the things that happened to people who who are you know I was born into a conflict, uh, and and you know my father was born into a conflict. And my father was, you know, was 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 part of the Israeli army, and we lost some friends in 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 the fighting. And I have Palestinian friends who sacrificed much more than us. But one of the most, I would say, one of the most terrible things that happened to people in this context is that you simply get used to it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> one of the one of the the fascinating pieces of data is that th- there's this happiness measure of, you know, cross-national happiness measure. And the Israeli society is ranked around the, 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 like the top five scores in the, in the happiness measure wow. around the world. And you ask yourself, 
what? I mean, it, something doesn't make sense here. You know, a society that experienced conflict and there are missiles on Tel Aviv every year and it's part of an occupation and makes the Palestinian life miserable. How can people be so happy? And they can be so happy because they get used to it and because that's life. And, and my personal experience mainly led me to realize that we simply cannot accept this as, you know, as, 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 as something that we should accept. And that was the first, the, the first thing. And the second thing was that I felt like, you know, we keep on trying to do the same things and are surprised that they provide the same result again and again. I think that it's, it was Einstein who said, who said this, <clears throat> this, this brilliant thing. And that we need, some, we need to be more creative, we need to be more deep, we need to be more sophisticated in trying to figure out ways to create change. And this this what led me to study psychology, like to understand that maybe the problem is not, you know, it's not a problem of ideology, of interest in the Israeli-Palestinian case. It's not really the problem of, you know, where the border would be. Mm -hmm. It's a problem of people's emotions, their narratives, their biases, their their societal beliefs. And, and if this is the problem, so this is also where we should look for the solution. Yeah. And, 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 and collective action or understanding, you know, what can lead people to engage in action and what can make their action effective and how can we motivate them through their emotions, their beliefs, their narratives, and how can we make their action or to help them in making their, their action very accurate mm -hmm. in terms of, and, and, and when I say accurate in terms of being effective, that's... At least, you know, I, I'm not sure that I'm doing the right thing in terms of, you know, bringing world peace and, and everything mm -hmm. would be great. But at least from my subjective perspective, that's maybe something that wasn't tried enough in this context. So mm -hmm. it's it's been a long longer answer that I than I no, wanted no. to give. <clears throat> no, thanks for thanks for sharing your story. It's uh, it's meaningful and it shows how how this area has real stakes. For you so my own background in social movements and collective action came from like a, a i guess a very specific subcultural space in american activism which is organized labor and so i had worked as a union organizer in graduate school and this was yeah my primary collective action experience to that point and, and since you know though i've been active in other sorts of social movements in different capacities but that's a, a very pragmatic activist subculture. And it's in part a, a result of structure of like, there's a, a structure to union organizing in the United States context is actually heavily regimented in most cases. Most of the time people are operating through the National Labor Relations Board, which creates like an election. And, you know, it, it creates a, a certain defined kind of crisp clear set of strategic decisions and sometimes some easy ones you know some sometimes it's quite clear what you have to do uh, and it's quite clear what would not be effective and there's also a sort of default orientation in organized labor uh, that's sort of like an openness and an approach of, of persuasion and, and greeting people who do not yet agree with you and so where some activist spaces, people encounter somebody who disagrees with them and they might, you know, tell them to fuck off, you know, like in the union organizing context, you're like, oh, you don't agree with me. Great. Let's get together and talk because we really need you in the union, you know, and that's that's what you kind of have to do structurally because you're trying to you're trying to win an election and in, in, in the context of a of a workplace. And so that was sort of my cultural background as an activist. And then I got I wound up spending, you know, more than a decade in some of the most liberal progressive communities in America. So like Ithaca, New York, Berkeley, California, San Francisco, you know, communities I, I love and really enjoyed being in as, as, you know, a progressive that kind of fit well in these places. But I also got a pretty up close view of how when you're in an ideologically homogenous environment, it has major advantages and disadvantages for mobilization. So on the one hand, you, you really kind of want uh, ideological homogeneity for mobilization. You want to get some like-minded people together to try to change what's going on. You know, a lot of great ideas in America have come out of the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, like a, you know, an ability to think 
50 years ahead of other folks, you know, I would argue it's been endemic to this place, which I'm not bored of, so I can just compliment this place. I'm, I'm, I'm adopted. Uh, and so that ideological homogeneity can be like a recipe for social change, um, get a bunch of people together and they can think like, what do we think, you know, and what should we think, you know, and they get that criticism and doubt out of their collective mind, you know. Uh, but it also can be a strategic disadvantage because you lose the ability to entertain the perspective of those who have not joined you yet. And so when it comes to tactics and strategy, it can sometimes drive you towards approaches that outside of your, you know, your, you know, ideological enclave are going to maybe look unpersuasive or even ridiculous, you know, and, and you can be inadvertently, you might have the next great idea society ought to listen to, but the way you prosecute it could be quite ineffective. And, and so I, you know, as an example, I remember, I'm, I hope I'm going to get this right, but there was uh, a code pink protest of the Marine Recruitment Center in downtown Berkeley in uh, kind of the late, late stages of the, uh, the Iraq war. And you know, I was I was against the Iraq War. I was an active protester in the early stages, and uh, uh, Berkeley was, you know, also very much against the Iraq War. And there was this kind of tacit standoff happening between the Marine recruitment folks and then uh, and then and the city of Berkeley. And so the Berkeley City Council, in, the, in this kind of hilarious culture wars move, reserved an official parking place for Code Pink in front of the Marine Recruitment Center uh, so to make as convenient as possible their protesting of the Marine Recruitment. And I remember uh, watching on the national news at one point when this pro these protests were escalating, uh, a bunch of Code Pink folks like locked arms blocking the door to the Marine Recruitment Center trying to stop, you know, stop people from from recruiting people to this, what I thought was a quite unjust war, you know? And so I'm, I'm with them, you know, and I'm watching this on television and they're kind of singing songs and, but they're kind of dressed sort of like ragtag and they're not necessarily singing the same song. And then the Marines show up and they're like cleanly dressed in suits, you know, and they're just saying like, I am just trying to go to work. I am only trying to go to work. And the protesters are getting kind of, kind of pushy, maybe not, violent per se but like shoving a little bit and they're like trying to just walk through the door and they're and they're like i am only trying to go to my workplace that's it and i was like oh my god like we made them look like the civil rights <laughs> protesters we made them look like the pacifist uh anti-war protesters and they're going to work to recruit people to fight on the front lines of an unjust war and how did we lose this narrative in the way we did the optics of it and i remember around that time kind of thinking that this is something I really wanted to study of, of how we could try to get both parts of social change strategy right, like the, the great ideas and the tactics. That's really interesting. And, and, then, and then in a way, what you're saying is that the, I mean, you can be very, you can feel like you're very right and just and maybe even motivate others from your own community to join you. But then your actual effect on, on others is, is might be questionable. Right. Right. Yeah. And then and then the question is what should be done in order to be effective or, you know, now continuing other conversations that we had yeah. dur during this year. What does it mean to be effective when we talk about social movement, when we talk about collective action? I think that there, there's that there are like serious questions about what does it mean to be effective? I mean, some people would say effectiveness means, I mean, you know, attracting many, many people to support the protest or to join the protest. So effective protest would be a protest that many people want to join or that many people would, would, would support. And I think that what I've heard you saying right now is you can create a protest that would be would, would look great for people who anyway support the values or or the ideas of the protest, but would almost look ridiculous or ineffective for people on the other side. And then the question of, you know, what exactly do you want to achieve in the protest? I think that that's one of the most important questions that I know that you've asked in in your research and, and we've asked in our research in, in many ways. One thing that I can offer now, mm -hmm. let, let yeah. me, tell yeah. me if, it, if it's okay with you, yeah. maybe, maybe to deal with this question of effectiveness, mm -hmm. we can like introduce the, the case study of what's happening now in Israel yeah, yeah. in terms of the, 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 the protest and our involvement in the protest and then ask, you know, what made this protest 
effective or what can prevent it from from being effective mm-hmm. and, and and then we can we, we can think about the different different parameters or different tactics yeah that sounds great yeah do you mind uh talking a little bit about the research you've been doing in in the Israeli Palestinian context in in recent months okay so 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 so, so I'll, I'll say as, as a background yeah. that um, I think that we are positioned in a relatively unique point uh, because when when I when I'm you know when I'm not on a sabbatical at Casbas uh, I'm 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 leading in Israel two, two different like entities I would say <clears throat> Uh, one, one entity is, is my research lab, and, and in the case of, of collective action, so our research lab is doing work on you know questions pertaining to collective action. You know what can motivate people to action, what would make collective action effective, and and other questions. But we're doing studies, like like many others are doing studies, and I know you know like like your lab is is doing studies. The other arm or the other entity, and I know that your work is also, you know, very much implemented in 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 in, in, the, in the real world. But but in Israel, what we did was creating an NGO, an NGO called Accord Social Psychology for Social Change, and this NGO is is basically implementing our scientific world work in in the real world. Mm-hmm. And what happened now in Israel is is I think that it's a fascinating. A, a, a situation for scientists, for for people like us, because immediately when the protest in Israel started, we offered our you can call it services like research and and, and science to the headquarters of the protest. So to give a little bit of a background, five months ago there were elections in Israel, and a very right wing i would even say radical right wing government won won the election for for the first time in many years i mean the right wing lead or or or, or win the elections in israel for many years that's the first time in which they didn't need anyone from the center or the left mm. sides of the political map to join them and they could and and did form a government which is a you can call it like a clear pure right-wing government, the most right ex- extremist government that has been you know, formed in Israel, I would say, ever. Mm-hmm. And immediately after the, this government like, like was, was appointed, they introduced they, what they call a, a, a judicial reform in, in the Israeli regime. And what we call, like I would say, the democratic camp in Israel would call a, a judicial rev- revolution. So they're basically trying to re- restructure the relationship between the different parts of the Israeli or, or political regime, giving much, much, much more power to the government and much less power to the entities that are supposed to defend the rights of minorities, promote equality, etc., like the Supreme Court or the Israeli parliament. And, and, and for many, many, many Israelis, this was a sign of like the end or potential end of the democratic regime in Israel. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, I think that we talked about it uh, in, in one of our lunch meetings here. You know, we've, we've experienced many challenges in, in, in Israel in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and other situations. I've never in my life experienced a situation in which I, you know, thought to myself that it's realistically possible that in one or two years from now, Israel, as I know it, or as we have knew it as as a democratic country, will simply not exist. Mm -hmm. So I'm not talking about the fact that it won't exist physically, but it won't exist as, as a democratic country. And this has led to, you know, th- this is really, I mean, it's 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 really concerning and worrying, and 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 you know, it, I would say, you know, it, it prevented me from sleeping at night, yeah. and and I really, and 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 I think that that's true for for many many Israelis, and that's that's the you know that's the negative side of what happened, but the positive side is that immediately immediately when the government introduced this this potential reform. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis went out to the streets and say, and said, "That's not going to happen. Not not in our shift." Mm-hmm. 
uh, and and you know one of the best slogans that I've I've seen was that uh, they said you, you know you messed up with the wrong generation. Uh, you, you, you don't even try to do these kind of things when it's in our in our shift it's not going to happen and i think that you know when you look at, at it in a, in a comparative like perspective comparing israel unfortunately to to you know countries like hungary or poland so the good news out there is that, is that the israeli public you know uh, uh, was was much 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 more like like i would say energetic and much, much more worried about what, what happened and realized very soon in the process that if, if, if we will not do something really dramatic and real fast, then maybe we're losing our country. Mm. And since then, in the last 21 weeks, every week, at least 200, between 200 to 300,000 people are going out to the streets either once a week or twice a week. And this is accompanied by also by many other actions that maybe we'll talk about them about them very, very soon. Mm -hmm. Just to give you a sense, 300,000 Israelis in terms of the proportion when taking into account the Israeli population is like, is, is equivalent to 15 to 20 million Americans. Mm -hmm. So think about 15 to 20 million Americans going out to the streets once or twice a week. I'm talking about Thousands and thousands of people who stopped working, mm -hmm. quit the, their jobs, wow. and are working like 24-7 in the protest. And these are not like, you know, usually we talk about these professional activists. These are not the professional activists. These are, you know, ordinary people. You know, my mother is 73 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, she told me two weeks ago that, 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 that she walked six miles around the Israeli parliament as part of the protest. I told her, you know, mommy, you, you didn't walk six miles in the last 10 years together. Yeah. And, and so, so this, is, this is, you know, the kind of people who are involved in the protest. And, 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 and it's amazing and it's exciting. And it's been very successful, at least successful in the sense that three weeks ago or three or four weeks ago, the Israeli government declared that they're posing, that they're posing this reform. So they're posing the reform. There's a negotiation. Right now, it looks as if it's not going to, you know, be, be implemented. Uh, but still, every week, hundreds of thousands of people are going out to the streets. Uh, and, and we can talk, if you want, about our part in this, in, in, in this process or what we did as, as, as a research team as part of this process. But, but that's the background. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's helpful. The in part because I'm woefully ignorant of the Israeli-Palestinian context. Uh, d besides, just being you know a news reader in the U.S. Uh, but if you don't mind, why why don't you tell us a little bit about the research that you've been doing with Accord? Uh, it's Accord, yeah, the your organization, um, and how it's plugged into the larger collective action that's been happening in Israel. I think we'd yeah, I'd be fascinated to hear more about it. So, so, so for us, I, I would say you know it's it's been. Uh, um, an, an amazing opportunity yeah. and immediately when, when when it happened or when we realized that that's what's going to happen uh, we created a team of researchers and political consultants we raised funding part of it in israel part of it in in, in the us and we approached like we, we didn't wait for anyone to approach us we approached the the headquarters of the protest and offered them help and it's interesting because it's there's an interesting structure for the protest in Israel right now that I think that was really you know that really helped us in making an impact mm -hmm. because what's happening in Israel is like there's a mess like there are 2007 sorry 207 NGOs that are involved in the protest that's the number so you have out of these 207, you know, you have academics against the reform and social workers against the reform and people in Tel Aviv against the reform and people in Jerusalem against the reform, 207 organizations. And these organizations are very, very different in terms of their personnel, in terms of their structure and in terms of their ideology. Mm -hmm. So all of them are against the reform, but some of them are also against the occupation whereas others are pro-occupation. 
Some of them would be only were created only in order to protest against the reformers. Others are organizations that are working pro-democratic values for many, many years. So they're very, very, very different. But beyond or, or you know, bringing together all these 207 organizations, there, there's a centralized headquarters. And these headquarters are organized. They're the ones who are bringing the funding. They are the ones who are creating the big demonstrations. And then they are the ones who are creating, I would call it, like the main narrative okay. of the demonstrations or of the protest, mm -hmm. which made it much, much easier for us to work or to use our research vis-a-vis -vis these, these headquarters, because it's easier. It would have been much, much harder to work you know, with 207 organizations. It's much easier when you have these headquarters. And we approach them. Israel is a very small place. It takes you three WhatsApp messages to get to the CEO of the headquarters, really. Yeah, and, and, and to tell him, you know, his name is Iran. It's easier. We, oh, yeah. Both of us are Iran. Iran, I want to work for you. We don't need money. We want to do the research for you. We want to help you to become more effective. Mm -hmm. It took us 24 hours to get there and, 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 and to get the seat around the table. And that's all we needed. And since then, what we've been doing, we're running studies on a, ba on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. On a wow. daily basis. So we've run since then more than 25 studies. Mm -hmm. Part of them are longitudinal studies in which we simply try to track changes in public opinion, in attitudes and emotions, in support for the protest. What do people find useful? What do people find less useful? Mm -hmm. Other parts of our studies, our studies are more experimental studies, mm -hmm. like very, very large scale experimental studies in which we try to test the effectiveness of different actions. And what we're basically trying to do is to make some contribution, I would say, to creating an effective strategy mm -hmm. for the protest. And in those experiments, what, how would you measure effectiveness or what would be measures that would relate to effectiveness? So, so I would say that uh, we, we have three main challenges that are translated into three different outcome measures in, in terms of effectiveness. Yeah. So, and, and this is in, in a way, you know, it's, it, you'll see very clearly that it speaks nicely to, to the kind of work that we've been doing before, you've been doing before us, and then we've done, and then, and then in, in this protest. But that's also what they asked us. So when we asked mm -hmm. the, you know, the people in the, in the headquarters of the protest, what, what are your challenges? Mm -hmm. What are your challenges? What are we trying to achieve? They asked three, three main questions. One question was, how do we motivate more and more people to engage in the protest? How do we bring people, you know, motivate them to leave their ho homes and, and get out of the streets? How do we create a norm mm -hmm. that, you know, that would say participating in a protest is what people do? Yeah. That's what people do. I mean, and, and if you don't do it, if on Saturday night you're not in the protest, you have to find a good excuse for that. So one thing is, how do we motivate people to action? Mm -hmm. Second question is, how do we create support for the protest and the protesters, even among people who are not on the streets? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the third question, which was the most important question for the, for the protest, and, and they defined it as the number one challenge, is how do we change the attitudes of people who support the government mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to make them or to convince them, to convince their leaders to change the policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So effectiveness in this sense would not be, you know, bringing more people to the streets and it won't be like making them support the protest. It would be making them tell their politicians, stop the reform or pose the reform because of many, even if I don't, I, I'm not very sympathetic to the, to, the, to the goals or the values of the protest, mm -hmm. you need to stop the reform. And that was the main challenge they posed. And, and, and I, can, I can tell you because, because I think that this is also where, at least the way I see it, 
our research was translated almost one by one to, to concrete actions of, of the protest. Mm -hmm. So this last way of conceptualizing success or a desirable outcome that you want to affect uh, with protest tactics, maybe you could speak to uh, some kind of example of where you studied that and, and also felt like that research wound up being implemented or, or valuable to the protest to the collective right. action. So, 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 so I'll give one example that I think that speaks nicely, you know, to, to our research, but would also maybe stimulate a conversation between us about effectiveness of different different means and different different tactics. Great. So it, it's interesting. I'll I'll, I'll 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 go back a little bit. And and in in 21, 2021 and twenty twenty two. Eric Schumann did or you know, published two papers that basically asked this question. I mean, what, what makes a protest effective? And, and in his case, he defined effectiveness as what would change the minds of the people who oppose the protest in, in, in a way that would make them, you know, a, a, or would lead them to put some pressure on their politicians or put some pressure on the people who lead their parties in 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 line with the demands of a protest that was that was the main question so the question wasn't about how do you motivate people for action and it wasn't also about how do you create support for the protest it was about how do you make a protest effective in terms of changing actual policies and what Eric suggested is that protests become or protests are most effective when they create a sense of what he called constructive disruption. Constructive disruption, it's, it's like a very delicate, I would say, balance between two very, very different things. So a protest should convey two different messages. Mm -hmm. One message is, is a message of constructiveness. Constructiveness means, you know, we're here to protest not because we want to destroy the society, not because we want to create a revolution, mm -hmm. but because we care. Mm -hmm. We want to be constructive. We care. We want to improve the situation. That's a constructive message. But this constructive message is balanced or should be balanced if we want to be effective, according to our definition, with some disruptive action. And disruptive actions or disruptive messages are messages that are basically saying, we're being constructive, but if you will not address our demands or our goals, you won't be able to manage the society here. I mean, we will make your life so miserable and your daily routines would be disrupted so much that at some point you would say, even if I disagree with you, I'm going to give up and I'm going to I'm going to do what you've what you've asked for. And, and we can delve more deeply into this this idea uh, of, of constructive disruption. Yeah. But when we approached the, the protest in Israel right from the start, we said you have to be or we will have to find a way to convey this message of constructive disruption. And we did two things mm -hmm. uh, or, or we, we tried to convince them to do two things, which were at the beginning, we were, I would I would say quite revolutionary, at least in the Israeli context. The first thing was to say, what's the best sign for constru constructiveness? I would mm -hmm. say, and 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 we identified the, the Israeli flag as this as this optimal sign. Israeli flag, mm -hmm. and I, and I think that in the U.S. it's also the same thing. For many many years in Israel, the flag was affiliated with the right wing. Mm -hmm for many years. The flag is like the Zionism, the ultimate patriotism, that's the right-wing flag. Mm -hmm. And we said, if we want to prove, quote unquote, that we're here because we care about Israel, not because we want to destroy Israel, it's because we care about the Israeli democracy, let's reclaim the Israeli flag. Mm -hmm. So what the protest, the headquarters of the protest did on the first week of the protest was to purchase thousands and thousands of huge flags and to give them free, free of charge to, to all the protesters. So anyone who, who, who arrived to the protest got a flag. So when you looked at the Israeli like protest, the pro-democracy protest, you saw thousands and thousands of flags. No one in Israel 
from the non-democratic right-wing camp could have said then, mm -hmm. you know, you're non-Zionist or you're against the country because it was very clear that the protests reclaimed the Israeli flag. That was a revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we offered the protest to initiate the most disruptive action mm -hmm. that could be imagined. Things that, you know, were never, never done in the history of Israel. I'll give you three examples. Mm -hmm. They closed the roads on the way to the Israel. There's one international airport in Israel. The protest closed it. Mm -hmm. And they closed it when the Israeli prime minister was supposed to fly to, uh, uh, you know, meetings outside of Israel, basically saying, you know, if you will not give us what we want, there is no, I mean, Israelis would not be able to go in and out of, of, of Israel. It's simply not going to happen. Mm -hmm. They convinced officers and, and soldiers in special units in the Israeli army to, you know, put out declarations saying that if this reform will pass, they will not show up for training in the Israeli army. And I'm not talking about, you know, dozens of people. I'm talking about thousands of people. Mm -hmm. This is the, in, 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 when it comes to a society in conflict, like the Israeli society, that's the optimal disruption. Mm -hmm. It led to the, to the situation in which the Israeli Minister of Defense approached Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, and said, you must pose the legislation because otherwise, I cannot guarantee that we can defend Israel. Mm -hmm. Like there's no, I mean, the Israeli army will tear apart if you do it. And the third thing is that they approached Israeli famous startup companies mm -hmm. and, 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 and leaders of these startup companies and, and convinced them to say, uh, or, or, or to say that if Israel will not be a democracy, or if this legislation will pass and would lead Israel towards a non-democratic like 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 process, then they will take their money mm -hmm. outside of Israel. And they already started doing it. The more extreme like representatives of the startup like 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 you know a, 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 a society in Israel already moved their money outside of Israel, and Israel already started getting some very negative indications from different like international financial like companies saying their warnings about about Israel. So these three things, mm -hmm. blocking roads, but, but meaningful roads like like the airport, like threatening the, the stability of the Israeli army and threatening the stability of the Israeli economy, when they were balanced with the constructiveness of reclaiming the Israeli flag, were a clear translation of what we called before constructive disruption. So on the one hand, the Israeli government said, we have to do something. We, we, we can't, I mean, Israel will not be able to manage if we want to address their goals. On the other hand, they couldn't say, you know, let's delegitimize these, these traitors or these protesters, because it was very clear that the protesters are, you know, they are the good part of the Israeli society. That's great. That's great. And I will say, and you'll be happy when I'll say it, I yeah. know, yeah. at the same time, it was very clear that we should make any possible effort to make sure that the protest will not become violent. Uh -huh. Yes. Because, because we realized, you know, from your work, from other people's work, that nonviolent protest would probably gain more public support. But on the other hand, we said, let's be as disruptive as we can without be, being violent. Yeah, it's that category of nonviolent but highly disruptive protest that I have found the most challenging to generalize about. It's very hard to generalize. People will ask me, uh, so is there a clear signal here, shutting down highways, bad idea? And I would say, no, it's not actually that clear. I would say that I've seen more evidence in the U.S. context that that would backfire as a strategy with respect to popular support as a very specific outcome uh, than that it would be effective. Again, popular support being the easiest thing to measure, most commonly measured. Uh, 
but that it's very hard to generalize. What kind, what kind of street are we talking about? You know, what kind of road are we talking about? What kind of community are we in? Very, very hard to generalize around the highly disruptive tactics, just in my own experience in the U.S. context. So, so as you know, we, we, we've also done studies in the U.S. and, yeah. and, and in Israel. And, and I would say, first of all, that I agree with you, that it's, it's hard to be very accurate about what, what, what kind of tactics would, you know, cross the line yeah. that would make them less, less favorable. But, but I, I, I will add two things to that. Mm-hmm. For me, the mechanism is very clear. It's not clear what kind of tactics would actually lead, yeah. accurately lead to this mechanism. So for yeah. me, w- what's very clear is that if you want to, if, if, if effectiveness means change, Okay, change in terms of policy, then constructive disruption is the, at least according to our studies, is the optimal tool. Now, I can see situations in which even, you know, the same tactic in one place would lead to constructive disruption and in the other place would not be consider, considered as constructive at all. And this makes it very... Hard to generalize, yeah. Yeah, complicated. Yeah. But... I think that also there, there's there is a delicate and interesting tension here between what you call, for example, in your in your JPSP great paper, it was 2020, right? I think that's right. <laughs> the, the 2020 paper. Yeah, you're right. So yeah. so the, the 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 outcome measure is is social support. Yeah. Is support of the protest. Yeah. And I think that here there, there's something really interesting because I can I can see a situation in which the protest is using tactics that would le- lead to a decrease in support of the protest mm-hmm. and at the same time an increase in support of addressing the protest's demands. Right, right, yeah, that is And, a and I think that that's what we saw yeah. here in Israel. For, so, for example, what happened now in Israel is that, you know, the most radical move was the was was what the 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 soldiers and officers in the army did because they basically violated the very fundamental contract of the israeli society because you know the 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 contract has been that you know no matter which government is ruling right now the military should do what the government wants the military to do and if the if the government is saying go out to war, you go out to war. And if the government is saying you know uh, uh, we're disengaging from Gaza and evacuating Israeli settlements, that's what the military should do. And people should not refuse to go to the army if 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 the if if the, if the government is implementing right wing or left wing policy. And what happened here was breaking the rules, because people, you know, said. Yeah, we will serve the army, but we want to serve only the army of the democratic like regime. And if it's a non-democratic regime, we're not going to be here anymore. Mm-hmm. And this act, and we saw it in the data, decreased support for the protest. So many people that are on the center of the Israeli society, I would say, or the Israeli political map, mm-hmm. said if, if, if supporting the protest means support like for for people saying we're not going to show up for training, we're not part of it. And at the same time, the same people said, but if this is what the protest, I mean, if that's what the protest does, we need to pose the reform. And that's, that's I think that that's part of the difference or, you know, when you look at the, the mismatch between your finding and our finding, I think that's, that's part of it. Yeah, so I, I'm totally comfortable with this pattern of data. So just to summarize the research we've done, at least this this paper that, that we're talking about now. Uh, Which was led by Matthew Feinberg, right? Yeah, yeah. My, yeah, Matthew Feinberg, my former student, um, spearheaded this, this line of work. And what we find across a bunch of experiments is that when you present people with the exact same uh, you know, news report of a of a of a protest action, uh, and you manipulate how extreme the tactics are, where extreme is defined as using uh, behaviors that are harmful to others or highly disruptive to social order, um, 
or uh, violent, you know, I would include violence as well, though we mostly were studying sub-violent extreme protest actions in this research, that people support the protest less uh, when they're seeing that version of the protest. They perceive the protesters as less moral. They identify with them less. They support the movement less. And then they often will support the cause, the policies less. Uh, now, the way we construct our argument is we say, there's a lot of stuff that you might be trying to do tactically as a social movement. There's a bunch of different strategies. You know, sometimes you're like I was saying before, sometimes you're a union, you're trying to withdraw your labor uh, from a workplace in order to wield some, you know, some power. Uh, sometimes you're at a very early stage of mobilization. You're just trying to get on the map. You're trying to agenda seed, as they say. Uh, maybe that's the stage with like animal rights protesters. Now uh, you're trying to get headlines you know you're trying to get you know on people's radar uh, other times you're trying to persuade perhaps other times you're trying to affect an election a ballot initiative a primary you know what have you uh, and then a lot of the time you're trying to apply direct pressure to institutions organizations elites make it not worth it to them to pursue a certain course of action and instead pressure them to to switch or or perhaps the general public or some seg segment of the general public other times you have a mix of strategies and still other times you're not thinking very strategically <laughs> <laughs> as well. I mean, I would even put in terms of the goals, sometimes uh, observers might think a set of protesters are not being strategic, that they're being just expressive. And it's actually that their goals are sort of invisible to the observers. So often when uh, when marginalized group members get together for some sort of collective action that might look unpersuasive and purely expressive or performative to an outside observer, uh, what they might be missing is that it's an empowerment act, you know, that it's a group of folks that are getting together to sort of delete, as we would say in our kind of pointy headed academic spaces, like delete these hegemonic ideas that come from the majority group members that might get into your head. Let's remove those and instead empower ourselves and get together and say, we're not going to think that way about us. We're going to think uh, we're going to we're going to think in a more empowering way about ourselves. And that's the you know, that was a lot of the gay rights mobilization of the of the 90s, you know, was about that. That's a lot of uh, uh, the Black is Beautiful movement, you know, in the 1970s, 60s and 70s. So sometimes, uh, and in those cases, if an observer was to show up and say, I am unpersuaded by this action, the protesters would be like, that's great. You know, like that's just, that's terrific evidence that I have done a good job of getting you out of my head, you know, because I'm trying to overcome that dual consciousness that, you know, that your majority group put in my brain, you know, and socialized me to have. I'm here to do the opposite of that. So it'd be great actually to have good evidence that you didn't like this. So I think there's a lot of stuff people try to do in movements. And so I have no problem at all, you know, with the idea that you might have a protest strategy uh, that's primarily about applying direct pressure to a population or institutions or elites. And what I would say is that usually you would also like to lose as little public support as possible while pursuing that strategy. So you might, for example, uh, strategically use symbols that resonate with the far right, the group that you expect will be pissed off about the tactic, potentially try to keep as many of them on board, respecting the protesters, potentially joining it as possible. Um, you know, so that's the kind of strategy that to my mind would make a lot of sense. You know, you're pursuing institutional pressure strategy and then you're using, you know, rhetoric, symbols, you know, mm -hmm. what have you in order to minimize a loss of public support or or so that you can still get the public support gains that you're investing in with other strategies that you're doing. So in any event, uh, in the U.S. context, I think an interesting question is, so, so having established, I really don't have any gripe with the way you're thinking about it. I think that when we did this project, a lot of people read us as saying it's all about popularity, you know, that activist groups are should just be trying to get popular. And we, we just don't think about it that way. In fact, the, the title of the paper is The Activist Dilemma, because we're sympathetic that the exact tactical constraints, if you're trying to maximize popularity, put you in a tough place for trying to do other stuff. Like, you know, like I was saying, like 
raise consciousness around your issue, get news coverage, uh, apply pressured institutions. You know, you're not going to really probably be able to maximize on these things at once. And so you want to, but you want to know about the trade-offs and you'd like to know how can we minimize, uh, say, say, you know, again, say you're doing the direct pressure strategy, you want to minimize, uh, you know, the trade-offs in other respects. And, and actually a lot of what you are talking about fits really well with our framework. Cause we, in our analysis, the first thing that happens when you engage in violence or some sort of sub violent, harmful, highly disruptive act like property destruction, vandalism, and so on. The first thing is that you're perceived as less moral. Well, what can you do about that? Is there, you know, is there stuff that you can do to make sure that the average observer sees you as moral? And I think you all invested in a lot of that kind of strategy. One of the things that I think about as like the big exception in the U.S., like I would say the U.S. is like really pretty uptight about protest tactics in from a cross-cultural perspective. So I also think that the U.S. is maybe a bit exceptional in this respect. Like they really like their protests nonviolent and and ideally not too disruptive i think there's like this very specific cultural thing going on here that's a bit a legacy of the civil rights movement uh which has been championed and lionized as like the kind of prototypical social movement and it, it ends up having a lot of influence over what people expect from activists um but if we had said that it's only about being popular, you know, uh, it would be sort of a ridiculous argument. I mean, we're in a country that has pictures of leaders of a violent revolution on its currency. It like carves them into the sides of mountains, you know, like it would be ridiculous for us to say under no conditions can you get away with uh, sub-violent, highly disruptive <laughs> protest tactics because uh, we, you know, we live in a country birthed of a popularly supported bloody revolution. And, and a lot of countries are like that. Um, so, there's clearly exceptions, but I think that our model actually can be somewhat helpful for directing us to understand when those exceptions happen. So, for example, when is the taking up of arms seen as justified? Well, when the force you're taking them up against is seen as already very immoral, it's seen that you have no other choice, and thus the use of violence or subviolent disruption, you know, is you, you're not seen as having any choice. And so it is seen as a moral act, you know, uh, but having it be the last resort, you know, is probably critical to maintaining popular support for those kinds of actions in the U.S. context and probably a lot of others. But I want to maybe suggest something that's that I'd be interested in your reaction to, which is that while I think that the way I think about things, the way you think about things might actually be pretty simpatico. What do you think about the possibility that the U.S. is a bit unusual uh, in having a real investment in nonviolent, non-extreme protest and that there might be we might be sort of uptight in the U.S. in terms of the bandwidth protesters are given before they lose support and that there might even be the specific legacy of the civil rights movement. This is a thought that I've had that I've, I've read in the social movements literature that civil rights movement super influential over what Americans think is like an acceptable way to protest and be an activist because it was so successful and moral and historically significant. You know, it's really championed, you know, and honestly, you know, most on the right in public opinion polling, you know, would say the civil rights movement was a good thing for America. And so it has this huge influence. And maybe the US is a bit exceptional in its like, obsession with nonviolent, non extreme protest in a way where our research might not traffic, you know, cleanly to other contexts, uh, contexts like Israel, Palestine. Uh, the popularity trade-offs that one might face for d highly disruptive tactics or violent tactics might be less in these contexts. I don't know. What do you think? First of all, I think that we should collaborate on a study that compares the effectiveness of, of tactics across different countries. Yes. Yeah. No, seriously. Well, that's the because, scientific response. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. That's the scientific I response. Yeah. Now, I'll say, now I'll say, I don't think that the U.S. is, I mean, I, I, my guess here, and that's a speculation, mm -hmm. is that the U.S. is not unique. Because I think that I would guess that anywhere around the world, even in the crazy Israeli society, but, but also in normal countries, no, seriously, um, people, when you ask them, would say that only the normative, peaceful protest is like favorable or acceptable. That's what they'll say. Mm -hmm. and, and in all of these cases, if you ask people, to what extent do they support or in favor or feel warm feelings towards the protest? Mm -hmm. So peaceful, normative, 
like protest would always always be superior over any other option mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the only caveat I'm adding here and now let, 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 let's have some debate uh, yeah, let's, yeah let's do it. is, is yeah. that it's simply not effective uh-huh. co- the, the way I see it so here is where I draw the line mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm taking you back to you know what I said an hour ago or something like lo- long time ago my again at least my, my, my experience and also my data in, 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 in many cases show that people don't give up their power out of goodwill. They're just not doing it. And it's true for, you know, a gender hierarchy and ethnic hierarchy and Israeli-Palestinian conflict and whatever, and immigrants in Europe and whatever you want. People don't give up their power out of goodwill. So the fact that they would see thousands of people on the streets marching and singing songs and raising flags and doing whatever would not lead to any change. It, they would say that it's really nice and they would support the, the, the protest or the cause. But at the end of the day, if they will be asked about, would you, I mean, have to allocate budgets or mm-hmm. if you have to reconsider the way, they, they would simply not do it. They will not do it because you need to put some pressure, some pressure on high power group people or individuals or politicians in order for them to actually create change. And this is where I draw the line between what makes a protest, you know, favorable. I mean, people would look at it as, 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 as a good thing, nice thing, support it, would, would, would empathize with it, whatever, versus what would make a, would create a situation in which people would say, I'm willing to change the policy. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to give up power. I'm willing to redistribute my you know, a, a, a resources because of this protest. And that's, these are two very, very different things. Now, where do, my, I think that what we offer is that, and, and this is again based mainly on Eric, Eric Schumann's work, is that the, 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 the line is, so, so a protest would be effective in this way, mainly when it will be non-normative, but also non-violent. Because, because this is exactly the trade of that you talked about before. When a protest becomes violent, mm-hmm. people are saying, you know, we cannot make compromises or give up to violence. That doesn't make sense. Okay, and, and, and we do not negotiate with violent people and we can respond violently. When, when, when the protest like use violence. Mm-hmm. So violence is for me, it's like it's, it's in most cases, you know, this we, right. have, we have one small result that shows differently. But in most cases, violence is not effective. That's what we get in, I would say, 90 percent of our of our studies, of our empirical studies, both in the US and, and in Israel. But protests are also not effective. Effective, in, it may, I mean, in terms of like, creating change in policy support when, they're not, when they are normative. Mm-hmm. So they are effective only in this, you know, very unique configuration of being, on the one hand, non-normative, non-normative meaning disruptive, but not crossing the line and being, and being violent. And, 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 you know, we find it in, in the U.S., we found it in Israel, we find it in, in, other, in, other, in other places. By the way, in Israel and also in the U.S., we found it in regards to many different issues. So we had protests of people with disabilities and Ethiopians and, 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 and uh, BLM protests here. And, and, and in all of these cases, again, with one exception, you know, this exception of the, 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 the how did you call it? The three-way interaction in which we found that violent, some violent was, was effective. Uh, in most cases, what we find is that effectiveness in terms of like support for changing policy is driven by mainly by non-violent, but also non-normative kind of actions. So I, I mean, I have almost, in some ways, I agree with your position, maybe, maybe even more than you do. Like I actually think that violence is uh, sometimes effective. You know, like I think there are examples. In some of that. cases, yeah. Like if you I look agree. at Erica Chenoweth's work, you know, they find definitely that non-violent social movements are more effective as they, you know, 
in, in their effort to tabulate these things, but that it's a difference of degree and that violent movements can be effective. Now, that doesn't mean that violence help, but then you can even find examples of at least a violent collective action helping. And then, you know, you want to talk about directly pressuring institutions to change. Like we have examples of violent revolutions and, and examples where anything less would have not succeeded, you know, like that powers that be were not going to give up the power. You know, a lot of colonial opposition was like that. There was no other way, you know. So I, I think that my own, the model that's in my head of collective action effectiveness is even even that complex that, you know, that that finding that violence uh, is ineffective. Violence is, even that is conditionalized, you know. But I would say that and I'm curious how you're measuring effectiveness in the context of a survey experiment, because my I don't really trust that in my survey experiments I can study that very confidently. Like I feel like I can study popular support uh, with some level of confidence, um, pretty high even, and I feel like our methods are good for that. But a global assessment of effectiveness is, I think, really tough with our methods. Uh, and I know you're thinking about it more complexly than just the results of survey experiments. But just as a couple of examples in the US context, I think it is really hard to generalize about whether, you know, a given strategy is the one that's going to be effective. So like, in the US context, we have examples where uh, really disruptive protest tactics were more effective. I mean, what's more disruptive than shutting a factory down because none of the workers are willing to come to work. You know, it completely paralyzes the factory. It's not a mellow strategy, you know, it's not chill. It's not trying to get the people who run the factory to really, really love the workers. That's not the idea. Now, I've advised unions on protest strategy and I've advised them to invest in strategies that would maximize popular support, even as they're making something like a public school unable to function. Um, and I think really smart unions do diversify their tactics. You know, it's like the nurses union in California will advocate for a bunch of compensation uh, improvements, but they'll also advocate for a better patient you know, to, to nurse ratio. And, and that's something that benefits everybody, you know. So uh, so you have those kinds of tactics where clearly investing in some sort of disruption makes sense. Uh, but then you also have other movements where I feel like public opinion wound up being a really big deal and the persuasion project was was a big part of it. I think that the civil rights movement got the successes it did for a great number of reasons and some of them direct pressuring of institutions, but a lot of the other successes owed to persuasion. So, so much of the strategy uh, in the civil rights movement starting in the 60s or even the late 50s into the 60s involved influencing judges' decision making. I mean, some of the biggest successes were around getting judges to decide in certain ways. And, the, and I think research is quite clear that judges respond to their sense of public opinion in their decision making. Uh, getting northerners to come south and help register people to vote getting Northern whites, politicians, and the general public to take sides against racist white conservatives that ran state governments in the South, uh, getting Congress people to vote for civil rights. They needed an assurance that they at least weren't going to lose too many votes uh, from, from doing so, from voting for the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s. And there was also in the civil rights movement a cultural project that was happening too that was like very much embedded in the minds of the mass public and and that involved you know trying to get black people full or fuller personhood in you know in americans minds and that's a project that has taken decades to unfold that's not done but when it ends up affecting tons and tons of stuff the outrage that people feel about police brutality the the rates of interracial marriage and interracial friendship, uh, the way minorities are treated in neighborhoods and organizations, voting for minority politicians in elections, public opinion on the new race related issues that end up entering the public sphere that they haven't applied direct pressure on yet, but you can you can bring that public opinion. It gets attached to the new issues as they emerge. Uh, the uh, I mean, uh, you know, tons of stuff, you know, support for civil rights struggles in other countries like the U.S. is a powerful actor. If they take a position, uh, even a small one to pressure against apartheid, it can be a really important thing. And where does that come from? You know, it comes from a belief in, in black people's personhood. So investing in that persuasion project was a big part of civil rights and was also 
uh, a big part of gay rights, you know, as well, which had a kind of a symmetrical, it, it had some symmetries. It wasn't the whole story at all, uh, but especially in a democracy, you know, in a world where democracy is probably the most, the most prevalent form of government, you know, a lot of social change goals are reached through the minds of the mass public. Uh, even if you're trying to just pressure elites, they're thinking about what loses them votes. They're thinking about what is going to, you know, keep them from getting kicked out of a restaurant or a country club or whatever. If it's a judge or an economic elite, you know, what's going to lead their kid to get mocked at boarding school? You know, like even if it's, you know, a not obvious effect of a public opinion, there's a bunch of ways that I think it matters. So. I wouldn't write it off either. Not that you are, but I, I, you know, there are movement examples in the U.S. where you could argue that was the central goal and, and that it, it was right for it to be. Yeah, but, but, but maybe the, the I'm, I, I, you know, 100% in agreement with, with everything that you said, but, but, but I think that the main conclusion, at least for me, the, the thing that I'm taking from what you said and what I said before is that it's, we need to be much, much more accurate in defining, you know, the goals or the or what effectiveness means for each and every, you know, movement in each and every stage, vis-a-vis -vis each and every audience. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that oftentimes we, we, we simply mix different things and then use like inaccurate means to achieve goals that are not well defined. So if, if we're talking about, you know, creating motivation or empowerment, which is a different thing among, you know, minority groups or low power groups that are part of the protest, this is one goal. And, 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 and if that's the main thing, some tactics or some actions may be, you know, the most relevant ones. If you want to create public support or persuasion or different, ver that's, an, that's another thing. And if you want to put pressure on, you know, a, 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 Decision makers, it's a third thing, mm -hmm. right? Or if you want to create pressure on decision makers through like their like voters, that's that's another thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that as long as we will not, you know, even when you said the the I think you you, you said that the title of the paper is the the protester dilemma, yeah, yeah right? the activist dilemma, yeah. But still, if if I yeah. remember correctly, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. still you had like one main DV in the paper which was support for the protest. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, that's true. And, 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 and I can say the same on, on our papers, whereas mm -hmm. I think that the more comprehensive, you know, a, a, a look at, at, at these questions should be, you know, there's a protest, who's the target audience? What's the goal when yeah. it comes to this target audience? And then what are the best tactics to achieve this goal? Now, you said before, and I agree, sometimes you have multiple goals and it's not just one thing. You want to achieve different things, but you have to prioritize. Right. Well, so how do you study that in a survey? I mean, because if we felt that we could measure just overall success of tactic, you know, in our survey experiments, we would have absolutely included that dependent variable because it's obviously the thing that matters oh, most. Uh, uh, but how, so how do you do that? No, you know, of course, it's it's an oversimplification because I'm going to do it in like 10 seconds, but but yeah. you can ask in the same survey, you know, like I'm just thinking out loud. In, in, in your uh, uh, strengthening democracy challenge, you had multiple DVs. Sure. Yeah. And you showed that some interventions are more effective for some DVs and some are, le if, 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 if I'm yeah, not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, yeah. That's right. right. Yeah. And I think that you can do the same thing here, right? Yeah. You can say, you know, let's, let's take three DVs. One is people's willingness to engage themselves in the action, mm. one. Mm -hmm. Second is people's support and affiliation with the action. Mm -hmm. Second thing, diff totally different question, mm -hmm. right? And the third thing, people's willingness to support a change in policy yeah. or willingness to do something to promote this change in policy. Yeah. Okay? These are three very different outcome measures. And, 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 and if we can show that, you know, some tactics are more effective among some audiences in, you know, promoting one of these outcomes, but not the other outcome, I think yeah. that we can say something. I mean, the richness of our understanding of these processes would, would, would be much higher. So totally agree. Those are three important things maybe, maybe that are, are conceptually. I, I, I think there are. Yeah, but I totally agree. Those are three really, really important outcomes 
that you can study in a self-report survey context and should. But just for the record, we do study, we do measure all three of those in the activist dilemma. And we generally find those are, are positively correlated in the context of our you know, studies. Um, By the way, I will yeah. say just so. But interest let, let in joining. In Israel, let me be in Israeli one time yeah, in this yeah, conversation do it, do it. and, please, and please. impolitely yeah. interrupt. Yeah. I will say that I assume that the correlation between these three things is, is generally is at positive. Least generally yeah. positive. Right. But the more, more interesting thing is to isolate these small groups of people who would say, you know, I don't support the sure. protest, but we should change the policy. Or right. I think that we should not change the policy. This, these are, even if these are small groups of people, they are the most interesting ones. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Those folks are super interesting. Yeah, so we do measure interest in joining, you know, joining up with these protesters, support for the movement and support for the, the causes and policies they advocate for. So we, you know, yeah, so we, we do study those things and, and we do find the same results are robust across all of them. I will say that the policy one, we get the least consistent decrease, you know, at least consistent negative effects of extreme protest tactics. But I think that has as much to do with the fact that people have a bunch of reasons for having the policy positions they do that aren't necessarily affected by exposure to a single protest of the sort that we were studying, you know, like people have partisanship, you know, they have ideology, you know. So there's a bunch of reasons why I think they're a little more rigid on that than they are on what do you think about this group you just saw do a thing you may or may not like. Um, and while we do, you know, I agree that it is interesting to find these folks in these cases where uh, you might be getting divergent effects and that when you get divergent effects that you would prefer to be increasing people's policy support than their support for the movement. I, I agree because, I mean, usually your movement cares most. Well, OK, actually. Yeah, I see you. Oh, it's a as question. A, yeah, it's a question. Yeah, yeah. It's a question. I would, as an activist, usually be willing to do that trade off, you know, of like, I would prefer that you like not like me necessarily that much, but like my policies, because I'm I'm not here to make friends or whatever in Survivor <laughs> Talk. I'm here to you know like pass some you know some kind of legislation or something like that. Uh, so I, I I agree with all that. We didn't find that that was a particularly common thing in the experiments. We, we didn't find any evidence for that in the experiments we did. But I certainly agree that must happen in I the know, world. And I you know for me the the, the the classic example is you know I I can give you two examples from from the Israeli context in which the high power group simply doesn't care. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, 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 I mean, I remember th there is a small group in Israel of uh, Jews from Ethiopian mm -hmm. origin. Mm -hmm. They're the only black community in Israel. It's a small group that is very, very highly discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And they're considered like very nice and polite people. And, 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 and for many, many years, there was a clear discrimination against them. And no one really cared. And they went out to protest for many years against racism and, and discrimination and no one did anything and no one did anything because everyone knew that you know they're so nice mm -hmm. and 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 they're not going to affect the you know they're not in terms of their number they're not enough the, the numbers are not high enough so they can you know affect the, the you know elections or something like that they can you know stand out and, and on the streets with their nice like flags and signs for years and no one would care Mm -hmm. And then at some point they came to us and they said, uh, uh, should we do more like violent things? Should we? And, 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 and we asked them, what do you want to achieve? Mm -hmm. And everyone told them, you know, people would like us less if we, we'll, you know, put cars on, on fire or I don't know what. Mm -hmm. But when they did that and they did that at some point. Suddenly, the government said we have to create a committee that will examine the, you know, the discrimination. Because, because what do you do mm -hmm. when, when, when the, high, you know, the high power groups simply don't care? Uh, you know, I, I, the, the bigger example that I have here, you know, in, in our case, in the Israeli case, in the last almost two decades, Israelis don't care about the occupation. They don't care. You know, Palestinians are there. There is conflict. Most Israelis, they don't care in, in the level that, you know, it's not an issue. No one talks about it. No one talks about it. So, And there are these anti-occupation movements who, stay, you know, they, 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 they're demonstrating for so many years very nicely, mm -hmm. very politely. 
and 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 then you know we are you know i ask myself we ask ourselves do they have to be violent in order for us to care I mean, do the Palestinians or people who support the Palestinians have to do something so dramatic? Because, you know, it's, it's when, I'm, when I'm, you know, putting aside my scientist-like hat and, and looking at, at it as, as just as a citizen, I'm saying mm-hmm. that's a terrible conclusion, right? right. I mean, yeah. you, do, you don't want to believe that only violent would make people care. It but definitely maybe, gets headlines. But, but it maybe gets attention, some, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, Iran, I mean, one thing that you and I really have in common is a, an interest in applied behavioral science. Uh, and so I'm just interested to hear sort of in a nutshell, what's your philosophy of the role of behavioral science in, you know, application and, and specifically application to social movements? Yes. Yeah, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, that, that's very large part of, I would say, even from my identity as, as a scientist. Yeah. Uh, I think that you know I, I see our role, and I, I'm, I'm you know to be very honestly, I've, I've been criticized on on this approach many times, mm-hmm. almost every time I pre- <laughs> present my work. But but I I, I don't I don't I, I mean I think that a very large part of social scientists' like role is to deal with like the biggest challenges of societies. Mm-hmm. And in this sense, I think that we, I would even say, we, we, we don't have the privilege of approaching these challenges from a, I would call it, from a descriptive perspective. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, for me, the, the, the parallel of it would be, you know, some, you, you know, someone who study, you know, biology or chemistry that would say, you know, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the biggest challenge, I don't know, cancer mm. or, or anything like that. And say, no, but I study, I studied it from, I studied from a, from a neutral perspective, you know, for and against, uh, 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 you know, uh, disease. And uh, no, uh, we simply cannot do it. Mm. I think that we should think of ourselves as in, in, in the very same way as people who have to deal with the challenges of the societies and to find, cu- you know, medications for the challenges of, of societies. And in, and in this sense, it means, on the one hand, to use a very, and I think that both of us are anyway there, you know, very interventionist approach in our studies mm-hmm. or in our science, mm-hmm. but then also to be much, much proactive in terms of asking ourselves, how can these findings be like implemented? Mm-hmm. And I think that, at least from my experience, this idea, I can even say the, the naive idea, that, you know, we, we, we will create the knowledge, we'll write our amazing papers, publish them in the best journals, and then people on, on, on the field that really want to create change will, will read our papers, use our insights and implement them. Simply doesn't work. It doesn't work because, you know, because we write our papers, most of us, maybe you write it better, but, but I, I, I mean, yeah. most of us write our papers in a way that's not accessible enough. Mm-hmm. We don't have them in our mind when we do that. And, and it's, it's, I think that it's, it makes sense because we do research yeah. Yeah. and they don't have not the time, not the energy, and many of them don't have the skills, you know, to translate this knowledge. And then the question is, I mean, whose role is it? to do this translation in a way that would actually make our, you know, studies or science worth something to, to the society. Mm-hmm. I think that it's our role. I think that it's our role. I, I don't think that anyone else can take our ideas or can take our scientific findings and implement them. Yeah. I don't think that we should be, you know, at the end of this chain. So I don't think that we should be the implementers. But I think that we should be very, very close to the implementer. So, you know, if, if, I, if I take this metaphor and, and, and use it, in, in, you know, we talked about the, the protest in Israel. I don't want to be the headquarters of the protest myself, mm-hmm. but I want to be there in the room. I want to design their tools. I want to do the research. I want to train the people. Mm-hmm. And to make sure that what they do is actually relying on, 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 on evidence and research and theory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I see it really similarly to you. And 
I've also done a lot of work in applied settings and been fortunate to have access to uh, political campaigns for, you know, causes and candidates that I support and unions, social movement organizations, public health organizations, and so on. And uh, it's interesting because like a lot of people, I think, have this perspective of our behavioral science is not strong enough to be applied in these settings, which is a reasonable thing to worry about for sure. We should definitely worry about that. Uh, but what I've found is at least the, the access points to applied, uh, applying behavioral science for me have been like becoming, you know, somehow plugged in to decision maker with decision makers because they're either interested or I've otherwise found some way to insinuate myself with them. <laughs> and my my experience is that they're talking about behavioral science, you know, like they're theorizing about human behavior and perceptions and beliefs and voting and movement support and, you know, concessions and what leads people to defer and you know, they're thinking about all this stuff. They just don't have systematic data on it, you know, um, and so there is a role for the kinds of data that we collect, and it can improve things relative to the the more impoverished, you know, data that folks have to work with because they're busy being specialists on something else, you know, like they know a bunch of stuff we don't know anything about, uh, and they're really good decision makers. Where I, anyway, am a terrible decision maker, uh, and so there is there is a role, especially if you can distill it, make it clear identify what matters about it for people, uh, there, there is a role. I mean, if I could complain, I would complain about like the amount of high level decision making in American politics and government that's based on focus groups, like an essentially <laughs> unpublishable methodology in the social sciences would just, you would go batshit crazy if you were to know the reality of this. It's terrifying that the high stakes decisions that are made on like this horrible research methodology, uh, which I'm not saying is like completely without use relative to like not even engaging with any data, but it's pretty darn close. Uh, but another thought that I have about I, doing... I, I want yeah, to relate yeah, to yeah. one of the points that you raised was mm -hmm. really interesting because for me, one of the main dilemma, you know, throughout our work with politicians, people in education or in different areas in, in, in the Israeli societies, you know, asking ourselves, what's a good enough yes, data that's or what evidence I to talk about too. Yeah. That, that, that we have? And, 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 and it, it's hard for researchers to go beyond the data. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you have your evidence on this study and it's a two by two study yeah. and you manipulated something and found something else. And then you say, I, I can't say something beyond that. Mm -hmm. But when you work with actual people in actual projects or campaigns, yeah, they, or they, yeah. they want you to provide answers also to things that you don't have in your data. And, and I, my answer to this question is, is, is quite clear because I think that I always think about their alternative. And the alternative is to base their decisions on pure intuition, intuition and experience. Mm -hmm. and, and from my perspective, even if, even if I haven't studied directly a certain question, mm -hmm. I do have the knowledge and, you know, and the depth in terms of understanding the, the you know, the theories, the, the, the aggregate of, of, of everything that we have in the field in order to give like good advice, even if I haven't studied something really specifically. Yeah. Uh, but it's hard. It's, it's, it's getting out of our, I would say, you know, our no, no, n n norms or the way we, we usually operate. And f at least for me, it took some time to get there. It totally took me time too. And I do have this other thought that may seem to contradict this last thing that I think we both agreed on, which is that I do think that this work, when you start doing the applied work, it really challenges you to try to really get it right. Uh, like, did you get it right? Did you do the work well? Is the work replicable? Is it conducted with the highest integrity and quality that you can do? Because these sorts of opportunities, I, I do think they separate people in terms of what their core motivations are. Because uh, if your motivation is to help, then uh, when you have an opportunity for impact, the quality of your work is going to go up. <laughs> and, and if your motivation is for yourself or something, then when you have that opportunity for greater relevance, the quality of your work will go down, arguably, uh, because you'll be able to produce sexier findings mm -hmm. with greater confidence and so on. And so it's a real differentiator how people approach that decision and whether they crank up the rigor or crank it down in the face of the opportunity for influence. I agree. So 
Iran, you've got this on the ground, but also in the data sets, uh, vantage point on on the Israeli-Palestinian situation, on the, the current situation in Israel. What do you think at a high level? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Where? What are you thinking? So, as I said at the beginning, I mean, I understand why many people are worried. Yeah. But I would say that at the same time, I'm very, very optimistic. And I'm very optimistic because I think that what happened right now is important beyond the specific judicial reform that was the reason for the protest. And in many, many ways, this current government made a huge favor to anyone who cares about democracy in Israel. Because they, in a way, recreated what I would call the democratic camp in Israel. So many groups that are very different from each other in terms of their ideologies, like join together to say, we really, really care about Israeli democracy. Mm -hmm. and, and Israeli democracy has been in a decrease for almost 20 years now. And no one has waken it up the way the current government has done right now. And what we see now, not only on the streets, but also in public opinion data, is a huge, huge consensus among both Jews and Arabs going against the actions of the current government and are basically saying also, you know, we're not going to stop by succeeding to pose this judicial reform. We're going to go further and re-examine the Israeli democracy and the practices of the current government. And I'm very, very optimistic that what, 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 what's happening right now on the streets mm -hmm. will be translated into a movement and then to, into a political power that can create real change. Because if people would define themselves, and, and you know, for, for people in the US, it's very, it's almost obvious that, you know, some people define themselves as Democrats, okay? So it's part of the, like, demo. in Israel, it's a new thing. So people who, for many, many years, didn't see democracy as their main or core identity part, now define themselves as part of the democratic camp. And when I look at the future, I'm saying, okay, so this would have implications on other issues as well. You can't see yourself as, as if your core identity is being a Democrat, how can you live with occupation? How can you live with discrimination against Arab citizens of Israel? How can you live with other non-democratic practices that we see in the Israeli society? So in many, many ways, this protest added many, many groups that previously were not part of the left wing or mm -hmm. what has been defined as a left wing camp in Israel mm -hmm. and now is reconstructed as a democratic camp. So I think that maybe there is a chance that some very, very positive things will happen in, in, in the future of the Israeli society. Yeah, yeah. Crisis precipitates change. Exactly. Yeah. And, and when you do your studies, uh, looking at the American democracy, effective polarization, main conflicts and, and, and challenges within the, the U.S. society, mm -hmm. are you optimistic, pessimistic? Where, do you, where would you locate yourself on this axis? I don't know if I'm optimistic, man. The, you know, like you, I'm kind of in the social change game. You know, I'm most interested in affecting some sort of positive social change or supporting uh, positive social change in society. And so I worry about worsening political divisions. Like, I don't think the trends have turned, you know, like things are continuing to get worse. Uh, and they stand as a huge barrier to affecting social change. And so... I think it's going to get a bit worse before before it turns, you know, uh, and it may be a similar sort of, oh, wow, I got this bad that it now marshals, uh, you know, a, a large enough majority, you know, to get through the sclerotic American federal system uh, and, and get some sort of significant legislation passed that can, can help with things like climate change, for example. So I guess that's the way I would view it. If I was to put my optimistic hat on, I would say that there has been an emergence over the last maybe decade or so uh, of higher tech political action, um, just more data-driven strategic work uh, happening in the spaces that, that I'm aware of and plugged into and, and care about seeing succeed. And that duality I was talking about before of like, 
ideological homogeneity can lead to the kind of like great new ideas and fire of mobilization that you need for effective collective action, but it can also deprive you of perspective taking and analytical perspective. I'm hoping that we can kind of get both those things in the U.S. Uh, through a division of labor and, and that, you know, folks like me can plug into that like analytical operation and support, you know, the probably the, the real actors that drive change. Uh, at least, yeah, if, if we did, that would be that would be a great thing. Uh, but Iran, want to say thank you for your excellent work, you know, in this context. It's really, really inspiring. It's a tremendous example of applied behavioral science on on politics, uh, the likes of which I don't I don't know if I've ever I've ever even heard of before. So keep it up. Uh, and, I, and I can definitely say the same thing about about your work. And it's also been, you know, fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed it. It's a it's a great it's been a great opportunity for my last week here in the in the U.S. before going back to Israel. So, Iran, did you have a big project, you know, a Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences type project, like a book project that you were working on before getting pulled away by all this? No, I, I wrote a book. Yeah. I, I finished it yesterday. Well, uh, but, but I think I told you, I wrote a book in Hebrew. That's amazing. Yeah. For the first time, I, I decided to, to write a book that's, you know, targeting, like the, 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 the target is the Israeli society. Mm-hmm. I've never written anything in Hebrew. Wow. You know, all my, 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 right. my all academic, academic books papers. are in English yeah. and my academic papers are in Hebrew. Mm. And for many years, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been told you should write something in Hebrew because people, you know, most Israelis won't, try, won't read stuff in English. Mm. So I decided to write a book. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, and, and I, I actually finished like the first draft yesterday. And it's a book that is, is like describing the way... Uh, my research and work can say something interesting about what's happening in Israeli society today and also what should be done in order maybe to create change in, in, in this society. To be honest, I don't know if it's good, the book. Mm-hmm. It's, it's because it's <laughs> sure very, it very different from anything that I've done in my life. But it was fun. In English, it's uh, uh, love to hate, question mark, the Israeli society in its journey to radicalization. Thank right you. On. Yeah, thank you. That was Iran Helprin in conversation with Rob Wheeler. As always, you can follow us online or in your podcast app of choice. And if you're interested in learning more about the center's people, projects, and rich history, you can visit our website at casbs.stanford.edu. Until next time, from everyone at CASBIS and the Human Centered Team, thanks for listening.